In this lecture, we will have an introduction to MATLAB's graphical user interface and introduce some of the basic programming concepts to get you started in writing programs in MATLAB. MATLAB's desktop environment is composed of a command window where you type in your commands. You can use MATLAB's command window as an advanced cal calculator. Typing in your mathematical operations, you will see the result appearing in the command window. In the command history, you will see the commands that you type in the command window will appear. You can retrieve these commands by highlighting them and copying and pasting them back in the command window. If you are on Windows machine, you can also highlight them and press F9 to re-execute them. The variables that you define in the command window will appear in the workspace. These variables have names, the values that are stored in them, and the types of data that they store. If you right-click on the columns in the workspace, you can select which additional information you would like to view about these variables, such as bytes, which will tell you how many bytes each variable takes. As you are working in MATLAB, MATLAB's execution is tied to a current folder on your computer. You can view the files and subfolders of that directory. You can also highlight the files and view its, their details in the details window. You can change the current directory by selecting one of the previously used working directories or browsing to a different folder. You can access MATLAB's help by going to the help menu and selecting product help. When you are writing your programs in MATLAB, you would be defining variables to store your data. Each variable is conceptually a box that has a name, type, and contents. In this example, we have defined a variable named apple that holds a single character and contains the, char the letter B. On your computer memory, the variables are organized in a linear fashion, each having an address of its own. Even though you access these boxes by their names as MATLAB executes your code, it keeps track of where these boxes are in the memory by their address. In some other programming languages you have access to, the, to these addresses, but in MATLAB the address information for the variables is hidden from you. Sometimes it's convenient to refer to a set of boxes with a single name. In MATLAB you can define array of boxes or matrices and these are stored as a collection of consecutive boxes in the memory. Although you are free to give whatever name you would like to your variables, you have to follow certain rules. A variable name should start with an uppercase or lowercase letter and can be followed only by one or more letters, numbers or underscores. So apple, apple1 or apple underscore one are all valid variable names. But one apple, underscore apple, or dollar apple are not okay. In MATLAB, variable names are case sensitive. So apple with small letters would refer to a different variable than apple with capital letters. Even though you can use existing function names such as square root as a variable name, this is not recommended. Once you create a variable named square root, you will not be able to use the square root function anymore. So avoid using function names as variables. As you define your variables and store data in them, they will appear in the workspace window. And you can track their values and data types in the workspace window. You can also use the who and the whose functions in the command window to display the currently defined variables and their properties. This will essentially list the same variables that you have in the workspace window. So who will just list the variables and whose will print a table of properties for each variable. There's a variable named ANS which stands for answer that will store the most recent result for your statement. So if you type 4 plus 6, the answer is 10, and it is stored in the special variable named ANS. You can see this variable in the workspace and its contents. 
To test whether a certain name exists, you can use the exist function. I'm just going to test whether a variable named apple exists. And the answer is zero, which means it does not. I will press the up arrow key to retrieve the most recent command and change apple to A to ask whether a variable named A exists in the current workspace. And when I hit enter, the answer is 1, which means that variable is currently available. To clear variables from the workspace, you would use the clear function and provide the name of the variable. And as I type this command, you can look at the workspace and see the variable A disappear from the workspace. You can type clear all to clear all available variables. In MATLAB, if a function accepts a string variable, a string argument, you can either provide the argument in parentheses um, in single quotes, or you can alternatively provide it with a space following the function name. So clear space all would work would do the same thing as clear parentheses quotes all. MATLAB code is composed of expressions and assignments. Expressions contain values, variables, operations on these values and variables, and function calls. A single line of code is called a statement. When you have a variable named name followed by an equal sign, it is called an assignment statement. The result of the right-hand side is calculated and stored into the variable on the left-hand side. Semicolon at the end of the statements are optional. If you don't place a semicolon at the end, MATLAB will display the result. If you place a semicolon at the end, MATLAB will suppress the output. When you are first writing your MATLAB code, you may omit the semicolons to see the result of each statement. But when you finish your code, it's recommended to put semicolons after each statement, so you can avoid a large output displayed in the command window. Here the result of 2 times sine of 1.4 is calculated and stored in the variable A. Let me change the format by which MATLAB displays the results and repeat this and I see that the result is displayed as 1.9709. If I repeat the same statement with a semicolon at the end, MATLAB will not display the result but the result will still be stored in the variable A as you can follow in the workspace window. And as I mentioned, the variables are case sensitive, so if you type capital A, it will be a different variable, and you can see both small a and capital A appear in the workspace window. Now let's work on an exercise for using variables and assignments. In this question, you are given two variables A and B, and you are asked to write code that will swap the contents of A and B. And in this example, A contains 5 and B contains 3. But your code should also work if A and B contained any other values. The incorrect way to solve this problem is to say A equals B and then B equals A. This is incorrect because MATLAB will execute your code line by line. And after the first line of code, the contents of B will override the contents of A. So you, in the second line of code, you would be using the overridden contents of A, which now includes the contents of B, which is 3. To solve this problem, you really need to think about variables as boxes. So let's do that. A is a box that contains the number 5, and B is a box that contains the number 3. When you say A equals B, you are taking the value that's inside B, which is 3, and placing it in A. And in the second line of code, when you say B, B equals A, you are taking the value that's in A and storing it in B. And at the end, you would have both boxes containing 3, which is incorrect. So the correct way to solve this problem is to introduce a third variable called temp. And what we will do is store the value that's inside A in temp, and then we will override the contents of A with B, and then we will retrieve the contents of temp back into B. So let's do that. What we will do is we will first take 
5 and place it in temp. So that would be uh, written as temp equals A. And in the second line of code, what we will do is we will take 3 and put it in A. And that is accomplished by saying A equals B. So now A contains 3, B contains 3, and temp contains 5. In the last, fi in the last uh, line of code, we will just say B equals temp, which will take whatever is inside temp and place it in the variable B. And as a result, we will have A containing 3, B containing 5, and temp, which we no longer care about, will have 5 left in it. So this is the correct way to swap the contents of two variables. One other way to solve this problem is to use a mathematical trick. And uh, in that case, we really don't need to introduce a third variable. What we will do is store the summation of a and b into the variable a. So initially a is 5 and b is 3. When I say a equals a plus b, what, I will do, what I'm doing is taking the summation of a and b and placing it in the variable a. So a is equal to 5, b is equal to 3, the summation is 8, and 8 will be placed in a. In the next step, what I will do is say b equals a minus b. So what I'm effectively doing is subtracting from the summation of a and b the value of b which will give me the original value of a. So let's put it, let's plug in the values. a now contains 8, b contains 3. Their subtraction will be 5, and that will be placed into b. And in the last step, I will say a equals a minus b. And what I am doing is subtracting from the summation the original value of a, which is now placed in b. So this is 8 minus 5. The result will be 3 and placed into a. And a will now contain 3. And I have effectively swapped the contents of a and b in three lines of code by saying a equals a plus b, b equals a minus b, and a equals a minus B. So um, the important message here is that as you are operating on your variables line by line, the contents of these variables will change and you would no longer have the old contents of the variables that you may expect to have. You have several different options for controlling how MATLAB displays numbers. The default format is the short format. You can change the way that MATLAB displays numbers by using format, space, and then the type of the format you would like to see. When I type 1 over 3, I will see four digits after the decimal point. But if I change format to long, then MATLAB will display the number in a larger number of significant digits. The internal representation of this number does not really change. This is just to control how MATLAB will display the number in the command window. If you want to view the numbers in scientific notation, you can say format short e, and then you will get the numbers displayed in the scientific notation. In the hexadecimal notation, each digit represents numbers from 0 to 15, but this will be the binary representation of this number, and it may or may not make sense to you, depending on whether or not you are familiar with the uh, way that MATLAB represents floating point numbers in memory. In the rational format, the numbers will be represented and displayed as rational numbers, and they will be simplified as necessary. For instance, 2 over 6 will be displayed as 1 over 3. If you need more control over how MATLAB displays numbers, you can use fprintf and sprintf functions. In both of these functions, the first argument is a, is a string that's enclosed with single quotes, and inside this string, the percent signs correspond to the arguments that you provide to the fprintf. So in this case, the first percent 5d corresponds to the first number 2, the second percent 05d corresponds to the second argument 2, 
and so on. The numbers and the letters that follow the percent sign have special meaning. When you specify a number, it represents the amount of space that MATLAB will allocate for printing that number. So percent 5D will print the number 2 with spaces preceding it. Percent 05D will print the number 2. Again, it will fit into 5 spaces, but now it will be preceded with zeros. Percent C stands for printing a character, and in this case MATLAB will not really print anything, and you will see just stars following the other star, because the number 2 does not really correspond to any printable character. Percent point 3F means that you want to print three decimal places after the point, and you would like to print it as a floating point number. So in this case, MATLAB will print 2.000. Notice that I have three digits after the decimal point. So let's try this in the MATLAB window. So let's try this in the MATLAB command window and see the result. As you can see, anything that does not come with the percent sign will be printed as is. In this case, we only have stars, so they will be printed as is, followed by four spaces, followed by a two. So that's how the percent 5T is printed. Percent 05D prints four zeros followed by a two. Percent C is not really printed because it's, it corresponds to a non-printable character. Percent point 3F will print this argument two with three decimal places after the point. Backslash followed by a letter has a special meaning and that helps you print special characters. In this case, backslash N represents a new line character. If you don't place backslash N, then a new line character is not printed. Another special character is the tab character, and you can see it printed as a number of spaces. It's good practice to end your format strings with a new line character. So fprintf is used to print a formatted string into the command window. sprintf takes the same arguments and interprets them in the same manner. However, the difference between fprintf and sprintf is that whereas fprintf prints into the command window, sprintf evaluates the result and returns it as an output argument. So you can take the result of sprintf and store it in a variable. When you are operating with numbers and variables, there are uh, several mathematical operators that you can utilize. The unary operator will negate the number that's following it. So minus 3 will be negative 3. Binary operators um, are addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and backward division, and the power symbol. Um, so 4 divided by 2 will give you 2, whereas 4 backward divide 2 is actually 2 over 4, which will give you 0.5. The power symbol uh, helps you take powers of numbers. So 3 to the power 2 will give you 9. When you have complex mathematical expressions that include multiple operators, you have to follow a set of operator precedence rules to evaluate them in the correct order. You would always evaluate the expressions that are in parentheses first, followed by the power symbol, the unary negation, multiplication and divisions are performed before addition and subtraction. And for the operators that have the same precedence rules, you would perform the operations from left to right. So let's work on these exercises. In the first example, we have a power symbol and a subtraction. And when we look at the order of operators, the power symbol comes first. So we should be evaluating 4 to the power 2 before we subtract 1 from it. So 4 to the power 2 is 8. A minus 1 will give you 7. In the next example, 2 minus 1 is parenthesized, so it will be calculated at first. 2 minus 1 is 1. 4 to the power 1 is 4. In the next example, 2 backward divided by 3. This is actually the same as saying 3 divided by 2, which will give you 1.5. In the next example, we have a multiplication sign, a subtraction, and a division. Remember that multiplication and division should be calculated before addition and subtraction. 
So we will evaluate 4 times 2, which is 8, and then 9 divided by 3, which is 3, followed by the subtraction, which is 8 minus 3, and that gives us 5. In the next example, we have a unary negation sign that will negate the number that follows it. In this case, it will make minus 3, and we are subtracting that from 5. 5 minus minus 3 will give us 8. In the last example, we have minus 3, which is negated again to give us plus 3. And the last minus sign is a subtraction. 5 minus 3 will give us 2. In this exercise, you are asked to write a MATLAB expression that represents this mathematical expression. So there are two ways of doing this. A one way is to write the entire expression in a single line, and the other is to divide it into little chunks and assign these chunks into separate variables, and then use these separate variables to construct the main expression. So let's do it the first way, where we will write the entire expression in a single line. So that is equal to 1 divided by open parenthesis 1 divided by r1 plus 1 divided by r2 plus 1 divided by r3 close parenthesis now if each of these terms were more complex it may have helped to enclose each of them in parenthesis now the other option is to store the values of each of these terms in separate variables so we would say a equals 1 divided by r1, b equals 1 divided by r2, c equals 1 divided by r3. And finally, we would combine these variables to write an expression for rt. rt equals 1 divided by a plus b plus c. Let's do this in MATLAB. And in order to do this in MATLAB, we have to give some example values to r1, r2, r3. And in this case, we will be using 1, 2, and 3, respectively. So let's do that. R1 equals 1, R2 equals 2, R3 equals 3. Notice that I did not have to write these assignment statements in separate lines. I can just separate them with semicolons and write all of them in a single line. So our expression will be 1 divided by 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. And notice that I can put a number of spaces between different variables in my expression, and MATLAB will ignore all the spaces that I have. Let's do it the other way. A equals 1 over R1, B equals 1 over R2, and C equals 1 over R3. And now our expression will be RT equals 1 over A plus B plus C. All right, let's change the format by which MATLAB displays numbers and repeat the expression, and we get 0.54. There are a large number of functions available in MATLAB, and you don't really need to memorize the usage of all of these functions because you always have MATLAB help available to you. To get help about a function, you would type help and then the function name or the category of functions in MATLAB. So let's try help floor, which will give us information about the floor function. If you want to open the help in a new graphical user interface, you would type doc, which stands for documentation, followed by the name of the function. And you will get MATLAB's help window opened up. And in this help window, first you will have a quick description for this function, the syntax for its basic usage, a detailed description, followed by some examples. And you can copy and paste these expressions into MATLAB window. Let's do that. Copy and paste into MATLAB, and you get the result. One way to copy and paste between different MATLAB windows is to highlight the expression and press F9, and this is equivalent to copying and pasting into the command window. When we make use of a function, there are several terms that you need to be familiar with. We are, in this case, calling the function abs, which is the absolute value function, and we provided a single argument in parenthesis. In this case, the argument is minus 4. And the abs function 
returns the result, which we are storing in the variable a. Some functions take zero arguments, some functions take one or more arguments. The order of these arguments may change the result. In this example, we are calling the remainder function to find the remainder of 13 divided by 5, which will give us 3. Versus, in the second example, we are finding the remainder of 5 divided by 13, which will give us 5. As you can see, when we change the order of these arguments, we get a different result. There are some important mathematical functions that uh, you need to be familiar with. Um, so ABS will return the absolute value of the number you provided with. Sine function will return the sine of the number. So sine of 5 will give you plus 1. Sine of minus 5 will give you minus 1, and sine of 0 will give you 0. Note that you can provide any valid mathematical expression inside the parenthesis. So let's have a more complicated example. Let's say a equals 3, and then sine of a squared minus 10. In this case, MATLAB will evaluate this expression, which is 3 squared 9 minus 10, which will result in minus 1. So this expression is equivalent to saying sine of minus 1, which will be minus 1. Some of the rounding functions in MATLAB are floor, seal, round, and fix, and we will see how to use these. The floor function will move down in the number scale, whereas the ceiling function will move up in the number scale. Since these are rounding functions, if you provide them whole integers, they will not change the result. So floor of 4 is going to return 4. It does not affect the whole numbers. So let's do uh, these examples. Floor of 3.5 will be 3. Ceiling of 3.5 will give you 4. The fix function works uh, in a different manner, depending on whether you are fixing a positive number or a negative number. The way that you can remember how fix works is that it will try to move the number closer to zero. So fix of 3.5 will be 3. Round of 3.5 is 4. Round of 2.5 is 3. Floor of minus 3.5 Remember, we are moving down in the number scale when we are calling floor function, and we will get minus 4. The ceiling of minus 3.5 is minus 3. Fixing minus 3.5 will move you closer to the 0, and you will get minus 3. Another way to remember how the fix function works is to just ignore the minus sign, and then take the floor of the number, in this case you'll get 3, and then place the minus sign back into the result, and you get minus 3. Round of minus 3.5 is going to be minus 4. Round of minus 2.5 is minus 3. So round function works uh, in a similar way. Uh, you can ignore the minus sign and then perform the rounding and put the minus sign back into the result. There are several constants in MATLAB. We have the mathematical pi, which is 3.14 and so on. i and j represent the complex number, which is the square root of minus 1. inf represents an infinitely large number. nan stands for not a number. You can have variable names that have these names. But once you define a variable with the same name as a special MATLAB constant, then you can no longer use these constants. For instance, you can just say pi equals 5. But from then on, whenever you say pi, the value inside the variable pi will be used. So pi times 3 will be 15. If you want to use the mathematical pi again, you need to clear this variable, and you would have access to the mathematical pi again. Let's work on these exercises. So 10 divided by 0 is infinite. We are dividing 10 into 
infinitely small pieces and we will have infinitely many of them. 0 divided by 10 is 0. Now 10 divided by 0 was infinite. But infinite multiplied by 0 will give you not a number. And again, infinite multiplied by 0 will give you not a number. Similarly, 0 divided by 0 will give you not a number. The way to think about infinite is it's a very large number. So infinite plus 1 will give you another very large number. So in this case, the result will be infinite again. When you add up two very large numbers, infinite plus infinite, you will get another very large number, which is infinite. But when you subtract a very large number from another very large number, the answer will be not a number, because you have no way of knowing comparably how large these two numbers were to each other. When we discuss variables, we mentioned that each variable can hold a different data type. In MATLAB, the data types include numeric, logical, and character data types. In numeric data types, we have the floating point numbers, integers, and complex numbers. Depending on which data type you use, you would be able to store a different range of numbers at a different resolution. When you create numbers in MATLAB, by default, they will have the double data type. The single data type is also a floating point number representation, but it has a smaller range and has a coarser grain resolution. To identify the maximum and minimum number you can represent in MATLAB, you would use the real max and real min function. Let's do that. Real max gives you 10 to the 308. Real min gives you 10 to the minus 308. So that's a very small number, very close to zero. You can create numbers by just typing them. So 0, a equals 0, 1, b equals 1. If you want to create a matrix of zeros or ones, you would call the zeros function with the number of rows and the number of columns that you would like to create. In this case, I will be creating a matrix of zeros that has five rows and four columns. Similarly, if I wanted to create a matrix of ones, let's say uh, three rows and two columns, MATLAB will create a new matrix that has three rows and two columns. You can think about matrices as tables of numbers. If you would like to create a table with random numbers, you would call the rand function again with the number of rows and the number of columns you would like to create. In this case, we will have a table, a matrix that has five rows and six columns. If you only provide a single number to any of these functions, then you will get a square matrix that has four rows and four columns in this case. Let's try it with the zeros function. Zeros three will give you a matrix that has three rows and three columns. The i function will give you a square matrix that's an identity matrix with diagonals equal to 1 and all the other entries equal to 0. The integer data types come in different sizes. And the numbers following the int represents the number of bits that are available in that data type. So int 8 will be an integer that you can store in 8 bits. Similarly, int 16, 32, and 64 are integers that you can store in 16, 32, and 64 bits. If you have a letter U in front of a data type, that usually means it's an unsigned integer. Let's take a look at the unsigned int 8 data type. This data type contains 8 bits, where each bit would be 0 or 1. The largest number is where we have ones in every single bit. So this is 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, 32, 64, and 128. When you add all of these up, you will get 255. There is a mathematical formula to calculate this summation. If you have numbers 1 plus 2 plus 2 to the power 2, 2 to the power 3, all the way to 2 to the power n, the result is 2 to the power n plus 1 
minus 1. And in this example, n equals 7. So we get 2 to the 8 minus 1, which is 256 minus 1. That's equal to 255. Now let's try to figure out the number of numbers we can represent in this 8-bit representation. Before we do that, let's start with the case where we had a single bit. So if we had a single bit, there are only two options. It can take 0 or 1. So we can only represent two numbers using a single bit. If we had two bits where each one can take a 0 or a 1, we have two options for the first bit multiplied by two options in the second bit. So that gives us 2 to the power 2, that's equal to four different numbers. Let's try to enumerate all of these different numbers. So we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And this is equal to 0, 1, 2, and 3. The largest number you can represent will be 1 minus the number of numbers you can represent. So in order to figure out the number of numbers you can represent in any number of bits, first figure out the largest number you can represent, which will contain all ones, and then add one to it. So let's get back to the 8-bit example. We had 8 bits. The largest number we can represent is 255. We will just add one to it. So we get 256 different numbers that we can represent. And these are numbers from 0 to 255. When the number is not unsigned, such as int 8, the first bit in the representation is assigned to the sign of the number. If the first bit is 0, then the rest of the digits will represent a positive number. If the first digit is 1, then the rest of the digits will represent a negative number. So when you allocate a single bit, so in the 8-bit representation, if you had a 0 followed by 6 zeros followed by a 1, this would be equal to plus 1. Whereas if you had a 1 followed by 6 zeros and then a 1, this would be equivalent to minus 1. So the first bit in the unsigned integer representations will denote the sign of the number. So the largest positive number we can represent in 8 bits will contain 7 ones because the first one will be reserved for the sign of the number. And that will be 0 followed by 7 ones. And this is equal to 127. So the largest positive number we can represent using 8 bits is 127. The smallest negative integer we can represent in 8 bits will be 1 followed by 7 ones, and that will be minus 127. Now this representation is redundant in the sense that 1 followed by all zeros and 0 followed by all zeros will both be equal to 0. In MATLAB conventions, they have decided to remove this redundancy and just say that if you have a negative number followed by all zeros, then we will just have that represent minus 128. So in MATLAB, the smallest 8-bit integer number is minus 128. To test whether a number or a variable is integer, you would use the isInteger function. Let's try to do that in MATLAB window. isInteger 5. Now the answer will not be what you expect. MATLAB will say false, which is the same as 0. The reason is that anytime you type a number in MATLAB, the default data type is a double. So even though this number is printed as 5, the underlying representation is a double data type. And you can see this in the workspace window. Let's say x equals 5, and then find the variable x. And you can see that it contains the value 5, but its data type 
its class is a double. So when I ask whether this is an integer, I will get the answer false. You can change the data type of a number by wrapping it with the appropriate data type. In this case, let's convert 5 to int 8 and store it in the variable x. And we will just watch what happens in the workspace window to the variable x. Now, x still contains 5, but the data type now is int 8. Because x can only contain 8 bits, if we try to store a larger number than 127, MATLAB will not be able to store this very large number. The logical data type can be thought of as a single bit number that can contain a 0 or a 1. A 0 corresponds to false and 1 corresponds to true value. A character data type is equivalent to an int 8 in the sense that it also contains 8 bits. But the way MATLAB will print and handle characters will be different. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a number and the character it represents. And that mapping is determined by the ASCII table. Let's look at the ASCII table. We have numbers going from 0 all the way to 127, and each of these numbers will correspond to a character. The alphabetical characters, starting from capital A and ending at capital Z, will have numeric representations starting from 65 going all the way to 90. The smaller case letters, starting from small case letter A, going all the way to small case letter Z have numeric representations starting from 97 going all the way to 122. So if I take 122 and convert it to a character, I will get the letter Z. In MATLAB, characters are specified using single quotes. So single quotes Z will be the character Z. Now I can convert this back to an integer and I will get 122. I can add numbers to characters which is equivalent to shifting them in the ASCII table. Let's take the 122 example again. So that maps to Z. Let's look at the character Z again. 122, if I subtract 1 from it, then I'm moving back in the alphabet. Minus 2 will give me x. In MATLAB, an array of characters is called a string. And you can just type the string and close in single quotes. In this case, let's say apple. And if you convert this to a number, you will get an array of numbers that correspond to their numeric representation. Now let's try to shift each of these letters by one and convert them back to characters. And you are effectively shifting the characters in Apple by one in the alphabet. You can store a string in a variable. Let's store the value orange in the variable Apple. Now Apple is a variable name and it contains the string orange. We can repeat the above exercise. Now replacing the string apple with the variable name apple. So MATLAB will, MATLAB will look at the variable apple and take its contents and add one to it and then convert it back to a character. And the result is the following. To identify the data type of a variable, you can use the class function. Let's do that for the variable x. Class of x is a double. Class of apple variable is a character array. And we already saw that we can use the whose function to list all the variables defined in the current workspace. To test whether a variable is a certain data type, you can use the isA function which will return true if x is unsigned int 32 bits, 
and false otherwise. There are two types of data conversions. In the explicit data conversion, you would be explicitly converting one data type to another. So when you say int 8 5.3, you are explicitly converting a double number to an 8-bit integer number. When you operate with multiple data types, MATLAB will automatically do the conversion for you. So if you, so if you say character A plus 5.3, MATLAB will first implicitly convert character A to its numeric representation and then add 5.3 to it. Character A plus 5.3 will give you 102.3. So if you can represent a larger range of numbers using double data types, why bother ever using integer data types? One reason would be that integers take less space, so you would require less amount of memory to execute your program. Another reason is that operations on integers are exact, whereas double representations may not be exact. But keep in mind that using an integer representation will have limitations on the range of numbers you can represent. If you try to store a number larger or smaller than what you can represent with that data type, MATLAB will truncate the number. So int A200 will result in 127. Int 8 minus 130 will give you the smallest negative number, which is minus 128. This is called the saturation arithmetic. Any floating point number can be represented as the multiplication of its significant bits with base to the power exponent. So I can rewrite point 23 as 23 multiplied by 10 to the minus 2. In this case, 23 is the significant digits and minus 2 is the exponent. When we are working with decimals, it's easier to operate in base 10. But remember that computer's representation will be in base 2. There are infinitely many floating point numbers between 0 and 1, and we cannot really represent all of these numbers in a limited number of bits. So in the floating point representation, we can only represent a certain selection of numbers in this range. For most practical purposes, the resolution is sufficient. There is also a limit on the smallest number you can represent in MATLAB. You can use the real min function to identify the smallest number. In addition to representing the floating point numbers in binary format, MATLAB has some special values it represents, such as infinite and not a number. These have pre-specified representations in binary format. Because of the limitations in the floating point number representation, some arithmetic operations may not give you the result you expect. For instance, if you are working with very large numbers, there is a coarser resolution in the representation. Let's say these sticks represent the numbers you can possibly represent in binary notation. And let's say x has a value here. If you then add a small number to x, let's say x plus 1, it may not be enough to move it to the next tick. So as a result, x plus 1 will remain at x. And if you subtract from x plus 1 and then minus x, you will get 0 as a result. Some examples of round off errors in MATLAB are given here. Let's try them in MATLAB. When we look at this expression, we see that it should evaluate to 0. 4 divided by 3 minus 1 should give us 1 over 3. 3 multiplied by 1 over 3 should give us 1. And then 1 minus 1 should give us 0. But remember that in floating point number representation, the numbers are not exact. So 1 over 3 would be a number that's very close to 1 over 3, but not necessarily exactly 1 over 3. So as a result, you may not get 0, but some other number. So let's try this in MATLAB and we get a very small number, 10 to the minus 16. In the next example, we are testing whether 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 equals 0 0.3. The double equal signs 
can be used to test the equality of two numbers. So in this case, we are testing whether the number on the left-hand side is equal to the number on the right-hand side. And as a result, we should get 1 if they are equal and 0 otherwise. The correct answer you expect to get in this example is 1. But when you evaluate it in MATLAB, you get a 0. This is again due to round off errors. The next example illustrates the problem that you have when you operate with very large numbers mixed with very small numbers. So 2 to the power 53 is a very large number. When you add 1 to it, you would not really move to the next floating point number representation and you would stay at 2 to the power 53. When you subtract 2 to the power 53 from that, as a result, you would get 0, which is not mathematically correct, but that's the best we can get under the limitations of the floating point number representation. And finally, sine of pi is mathematically 0, but in MATLAB, again, we get a very small number. As I mentioned before, Characters in MATLAB are encoded as 8-bit integers. So the first example, we are converting the character A to its number representation, and we get 97. You don't need to memorize this mapping, but you need to know how to convert between the two. If we add 1 to the letter A, MATLAB will implicitly convert letter A to its numeric representation, which is 97, and as a result, we will get 98. If you would like to convert a number back to a character, you can wrap it with the character function. In this case, we get the letter B. Instead of converting a single character, we can convert an array of characters, also named a string that's enclosed in single quotes, to numbers. Let's convert A, B, C, D to double, and we get four numbers, each corresponding to the appropriate letter. We can use addition and subtraction to shift letters in the alphabet. So let's do A, B, C, D plus 1 and convert it back to a character and we get B, C, D, E. When you are working with functions that accept a string argument, such as converting the string A, B, C, D to integers, you can either type the string in parentheses and close with single quotes, or you can follow the function name with the string separated by a space and they will both give you the same result. You can generate random numbers in MATLAB by calling the rand function. The way that random number generator works in MATLAB is that there's a pre-specified sequence of random numbers, let's say 3, 100, 200, and every time you call the rand function, the next one of these random numbers will be returned to you. When you first start your MATLAB window, this random number generator will start from the first location. So if you close and reopen your MATLAB window, you will get the same random number. To randomly change the current location of the random number generator, you can use the RNG shuffle function. In the first problem, we are asked to generate a random number between 0 and 10. MATLAB's random number generator will return numbers that are between 0 and 1. So all we have to do is just multiply that with 10 to get a number that's between 0 and 10. In the next problem, we are asked to generate a random number between low and high. So low and high will be variables that contain numbers in them. And in this example, we will use low equals 5, high equals 10. In the next problem, we want to generate a random number between two values, low and high. And in this example, we will use low equals 5 and high equals 10. You need to focus on the range at which you want to generate the random number. So in this case, we want to generate numbers between 5 and 10. The range is 5. So we need to be able to generate random numbers that are between 0 and 5, and then shift them by 5 to move them into the correct range. In MATLAB, to solve this problem, we just need to do 5 times rand. This will give us a random number between 0 and 5, and then just shift that by 5, to get random numbers between 5 and 10. In the last problem, we want to generate a random integer number between 1 and 10. Normally, random function generator will give us a floating point number. And what we could do is just take the ceiling of that number to get an integer number. 
So ceiling of 10 multiplied by a random number will give us an integer random number between 1 and 10. If you have quick calculations, you can just work on the command window. But once your code gets more complex, you really need to write it and save it into a file that you can re-execute anytime you want. There are two ways of writing code in the MATLAB files. The first one is scripts and the other one is functions. You can copy and paste any code that you type in the command window into a script. And a script is a text file that has a .m extension. The script will have access to the same variables as you have in the workspace in your command window. Functions are special scripts in that they can also accept input arguments and can return output values. Functions will have their own workspace. So the variables that you have in the command window workspace will not be accessible to functions unless you pass them as input arguments. Let's write a script in MATLAB that will ask the user for two numbers and then print the sum of their squares. To create a file in MATLAB, you can use the edit command followed by the file name. And this will open up the editor where you can type in your commands. When giving names to your files, make sure that they do not contain any space characters. And I would also recommend that you name your files with all lowercase letters and make sure that you place the .m extension at the end of your MATLAB scripts or function names. So when we try to edit this file, MATLAB will complain that this file does not exist in the current folder, and um, it's asking us whether we would like to create a new file, and we will just say yes. MATLAB will open the editor window where we can type in commands. Let's copy and paste the code given to us in this exercise into the script the first line of code is asking the user to enter a number. The input function will first print this string that you provide and then return the number that the user inputs as a returned value which we are storing in the variable a. Similarly, we will ask the user to enter the second number and store the value in the variable b. Finally, we will use an fprintf function to print the sum of squares of these two numbers. In the fprintf statement, the first argument is the format string, which will be printed exactly as is, except for the percent format specifiers and the backslash n, which corresponds to a new line character. The percent f specifies that MATLAB should print a squared plus b squared as a floating point number. After we write this script, let's go ahead and save it file, save, or you can just hit Control s to save this on Windows machines. And then to execute this script, we will just type the name of this file in the command window. Print sum of squares, hit enter, and as you can see, the execution went into this script and it will execute it line by line. Enter the first number, let's enter 5, enter the second number, let's enter 2, and the result is printed as 29. Instead of typing the file name in the command window, you can also directly execute the script from the editor window by clicking on this ROM button in the toolbar. So let's do that. And we fall back to the command window, enter the first number, 5, enter the second number, 2. The result is 29. In the next example, let's write a function instead of a script, and the name of this function will be sum of squares, and it will return the sum of its two input arguments. We will not ask the user for input, since the input will be provided as part of the input arguments to this function. The final answer should also not use fprintf, but instead we will just return the result from the function. Also remember to place semicolons at the end of your statements so we don't get any extra printing in the command window. Again, we will use the edit function to create this sum of squares file. MATLAB will ask us if we would like to create this new file. Let's just say yes. The first line of your function file should include function followed by the output arguments that you would like to return out 
equals the name of the function, which should be the same as the file name, except for the .m extension, sum of squares, followed by open parenthesis, followed by input arguments, and then close the parenthesis. So this first line of code determines which inputs should be provided to this function and which outputs that this function should return. Inside your function, you should have an expression that stores a value in the output argument. Let's just say out equals a times a plus b times b, and we are done writing this function. We can go back to the command window and type the name of this function, sum of squares. If you don't provide any input arguments, MATLAB will complain and give you an error saying that input argument is not defined. The proper way of calling this function is to provide two input arguments to it, let's say 5, 2. So when this sum of squares function is being executed, the value of a will be 5 and the value of b will be 2. And as a result of its execution, the out variable will contain the sum of the squares of a and b. When you are writing your functions, it's good practice to write comments that explain what your function does and how it does it. Inside your MATLAB files, you can write a single line of comment using a percent sign. If you would like to write a multiple lined comment, you would need to start with percent open curly brackets and end your multi-line comment with percent close curly bracket. In MATLAB, there's also something called a code block that helps you separate your file into different sections. To write a code block, you need two percent signs at the beginning of a line followed by a space character. Let's go back to the sum of squares function and write comments that explain what the file does. Let's give a one-line description of this function. This function calculates the sum of squares of, of two numbers and also explain what inputs and outputs this function has. Inputs A and B are two numbers. Output out is their sum of squares. Notice that I composed these three comments as individual lines, but I can also create a block comment using open curly brackets, in which case I no longer need to precede each line with a percent sign. Comments are just for you and others to read. MATLAB, when it executes your file, will ignore the comments.